الحمد لله فاضل الوجود من العدم وجائع النور من الظلم ومخرج الصب من الألم ومرق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الأكرم ذو الشرف الأشم والنور أتم والكتاب المحكم خير ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فنصلي ونسلم ونبارك على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد بن عبد الله وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار عباد الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله وحسن عبادتك All praise is due to Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And peace and blessings be upon him, last and final messenger. He who Allah guides will never be misguided. And he who Allah misguides will never be guided. We begin today's khutbah with a problem that many of us face internally. And sadly, we affect our youth and the people around us by it. And it is the problem of judgment. Many a time when we look at a specific person, based on their appearance, based on their age, based on how long their beard is, or if they're wearing hijab or not, we decide to make a decision about their religiosity. <coughs> we decide to make a decision about who they are as individuals. And the Prophet وسلم, time and time and time again, story after story, is trying to make us overcome that innate response that we have. And a beautiful story comes to mind. The story of the Sahabi by the name of Abu Muhjin. In the Battle of Khaybar, Abu Muhjin, at this point, alcohol had become forbidden. And it had become forbidden to drink alcohol at any time. In the Battle of Khaybar, Abu Muhjin began to drink alcohol. And he got intoxicated. So they brought Abu Muhajin to the Prophet And the Prophet commanded Abu Muhajin to be punished the way Islam deems punishment of intoxication publicly. And as they were punishing him, one of the Sahaba said, how can you be so dumb to drink alcohol? And the Prophet looked at that Sahabi and he says, Da'u, leave him. فَإِنَّهُ رَجُلٌ يُحِبُّ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Truly Abu Muhajir is a man that loves Allah and his messenger. On the outside, if one of us had seen one of our brothers or one of our sisters drinking alcohol, what would be our response? Our response would be this person clearly isn't a good Muslim. Clearly this person doesn't know anything about the deen. But look at the Prophet's response. Taking it so logically, so lovingly, he knew that this individual just made a mistake. And it is okay because he knows that we as human beings, our name is insan, it comes from the root word nisyan. Our name is humans. And as humans, every last one of us is forgetful. Every last one of us can make mistakes. So the Prophet, instead of judging this individual, instead of putting a label on him and saying he's a bad Muslim, He's teaching his Sahaba and teaching every one of us. Truly, this man loves Allah and his messenger. And sadly, we do this even to those that are scholars. And it happens so frequently that we don't even think about it. And a beautiful story. <laughs> Imam al-Bukhari, at the time, was, being, was becoming famous. And people said, that he had memorized so many hadith. So the Khalifa at the time wanted to test Imam al-Bukhari. So what he did was he brought 10 hufal, 10 people that could memorize. And he gave each of them 10 hadith. But he messed up the narration, the narration chain of each hadith. He made every single hadith different. And he brought Imam al-Bukhari in front of everybody. And, he, and the first individual began. So he began reciting one hadith. And after he had finished, 
all ten ahadith. Imam Bukhari would look at him and say, I don't know any of the hadith that you just said. So the second person said all ten ahadith. And Imam Bukhari says, I don't know a single hadith of what you just said. And the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And the people that were sitting listening to this, they said, this is the famous Imam Bukhari? Really? Not a single hadith. He can't know one hadith. How is he, how is he so knowledgeable? But the scholars, the one that had true knowledge, they said, Fahim al Rajul. The man understood. No way that he couldn't know these simple hadith that everybody knows. Something must be up. So after all 100 hadith had been said, Imam Bukhari says, I don't know any of the hadith that you said. But this individual, your hadith was this, and the correct way to say it is one, two, three. The knowledge of Imam Bukhari, he memorized the way that they said it incorrectly. Not just the way they said it correctly. That people assume that this man must be ignorant. Because he said, I do not know. But truly he had that knowledge. And so often we see it with our scholars today. When we ask them a question, we get upset with them when they tell us, I don't know the answer to that question. And then we look at them and say, what kind of scholar are you? What kind of teacher are you? And it just happened very recently to one of our scholars in America, where he was asked a difficult question. And publicly he said, I am not aware of the answer to this question. And on social media it blew up. How can one of our so-called scholars not know the answer? We begin to judge them even before we start to understand that it is out of the hikmah, out of wisdom, to say, I don't know. But sadly, we as the, we as the people, we're so quick to judge. We're so quick to look at individuals and make judgments. But the Prophet وسلم, is teaching us something. He says, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum, wa la ila amwalikum, wa la kin yanzuru ila kunubikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at the way you look, or how much money you have in the bank, but He looks at our hearts. And none of us in this room or anywhere in the world can tell what is in someone else's heart. So who are we to judge others? Who are we to make assumptions of others? How dare we do that? And it happens more often than not to our sisters. We see a sister walking in the masjid or walking outside, and sadly, even if she's just not wearing hijab, we begin to make predispositions of her. We begin to judge her negatively, as if she is lesser than us. But we don't know what's in her heart. And this is what the people before us used to do. Imam al-Shafi'i He would look at an individual walking into his class. And he used to sit comfortably because he had a knee problem. But when he'd see a new individual come in, he would sit up straight. Because he would fear that the individual coming in might be more knowledgeable than him. And this is Imam Shafi'i. Students would come from far and wide to learn from him. But out of his humility, he would see every new individual that he didn't know, every new student of knowledge that he didn't know. And he assumed this person might be more knowledgeable than me. Even greater, he would say, even greater. He would say, I don't know if my deeds are accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe this individual's deeds are accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not mine. This is how we should approach when we see other people. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran. He says, وَالَّذِينَ يَأْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةً إِنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ and the people that do good, and that give good, they do it and their hearts are shaking. Why? Why are they shaking? 
They're shaking because they don't know if my deeds are accepted. They don't know if my prayer has been accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if that big donation that I just gave, was it a donation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it a donation so that I look like I'm like, look, look how much I gave. I'm the generous person. I am the person that prays Qiyamul Layl and comes to Fajr every Salah. I am the person that prays in the Masjid all the time. We don't know what's in other people's hearts. So we can't assume that we know. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was upset at the most beloved of person to him when he made an assumption of another person. They used to call him Hibbu ibn Hibb al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uzam ibn Zayd. Uzam ibn Zayd in one of the battles, he was running after one of the people that they were fighting against. And he cornered this individual until he was right on top of him. He was going to kill him. And this individual out loud said, Ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So Zab ibn Zayd was one of his companions, one of the people of Ansar. So this individual stopped because he heard this man give shahad. But Usama ibn Zayd went and killed this individual. So when Usama ibn Zayd came back to the Prophet وسلم, the Ansari told the Prophet what had happened. And the Prophet got so angry and he said, Ya Usama, Asa qatta an qalbih. Oh Usama, did you open his heart? Did you see inside his heart and know that he didn't really become Muslim? Usama ibn Zayd continued walking that day. And he said, I had wished I had become Muslim the day after this had happened. Just so the Prophet wouldn't be so mad with me. This is the level that they used to maintain themselves. This is the level of the Prophet wants to teach every last one of us. Don't look at a person and make judgments upon them. Realize that they can be in a better state than you are. Realize that they can be better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you are. And this humility isn't a bad thing. We are taught by the Prophet sallallahu <laughs> Whoever humbles themselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will raise them. So every one of us should humble ourselves and look at the people around us and say, this person might be better than me. Not only should I treat them with respect because they are human, but because they can be better than me in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. and say them in our heads. To make assumptions and act upon them ourselves. It is even more terrible. It is even worse when we begin to spread these terrible sayings around. In the famous Hadith al-Ifq, when Umina Aisha after one of the battles, the Prophet sallallahu had taken his wife. And on the way back to Medina, his wife went to the bathroom. And in the past, there wasn't bathrooms like we have today. The way they used to go to the bathroom is they would walk very far so that no one could see them. And they would make sure to come back before the qafir, before the, the caravan leaves. So Umin Aisha recites this story. She says, at the time I was a young woman, I wasn't very heavy. So I went to the bathroom and I had lost something that my mother had given me. So I went looking for it. And when I came back, the caravan had left. So I decided to stay put. And when they arrive at Medina, they'll realize that I'm not with them, they'll come back and get me. So what the Prophet وسلم, used to do, he used to leave one individual, one Sahabi, and he would tell him, stay at the end of the caravan, behind the caravan by one day or half a day. 
If anyone leaves anything, pick it up, take it with you. And this individual at the time was the name of Safwan. Safwan ibn Mu'attib. And he was of the people of Bajr. Safwan was walking behind the caravan and he sees this object on the floor, so he comes closer to it and he realizes that it's our mother Aisha. <coughs> so he's confused. Why are you here? He said, I did not respond to him. He said, she says, with all etiquette and respect, he brings down his napa, his camel. And he walks far away from me. And he turns around. And he tells me to get on. I get on the camel and I'm fully done. He comes back, raises the camel and begins to walk back to Medina. And she says, all the way back, he didn't say one word to me. The whole time, he was just remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when they walk into Medina, the head of the munafiqeen, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salim, and a group of the hypocrites, the munafiqeen means hypocrites, were sitting at the gates of Medina. And they see Safwan pulling a camel. And Umina is sitting on top of it. And instead of assuming khair, instead of assuming good, instead of saying that Umina Aisha might have been lost, and Safwan brought her back, they said these two must have been planning something, and they stopped there. They didn't say anything outright, but they made that assumption. <coughs> that is one problem. The bigger problem is that this rumor spread like wild, wildfire. Everyone began judging. And everyone not only judged themselves, but allowed the judgment to be passed on to the next person. Did you hear what happened? Did you see what happened? So why are and Aisha? They were walking together. Did you see that? Did you hear that? How often do we hear that today? Rumors spread like wildfire, even from nothing. We make a judgment of people and that becomes the reality that we live in. That becomes our reality. And it happens, I thought it would happen as youth. And as we get older, it would stop. But sadly, just like the youth, the adults have it too. Rumors just spread, judgments begin. And all of a sudden, we begin talking about people that are righteous. Umin Aisha says, I was sick after that had happened. Right away, I got sick. And I asked the Prophet Wasallam, can I stay with my parents? She later said, that rumor spread for nearly a whole month of people talking about her and Sayyidina Safwan. A whole month of people judging Ummina Aisha. And she's our mother. Now let alone one of our sisters or one of our brothers. So it is of the utmost, it is terrible enough if we judge people in our heads. But let it be an obligation on every one of us starting today that no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, we will never talk about someone behind their back. We will never judge someone that we cannot see or that we did not hear. And that was the thing that the Sahaba did. They didn't even see the act. But many of them said the act had happened. And the Sahaba are human just like us. They make mistakes, of course. But we have to learn from their, from their teachings because they had the Prophet وسلم, with them. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow every one of us not to judge and allow us to be of the utmost respect. من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا. In the first part of the khutbah, 
we talked about the importance of not judging others and not basing our judgments on the way people appear. And more importantly, not talking about others, especially when we don't have all the facts. We shouldn't talk about others, period, but especially so when we don't have all the facts. But there's something that we can do as Muslims, and something that is of the utmost importance. The first thing we must do as Muslims is put ourselves in situations where people don't talk badly about us. And it's ever so prominent in the community that we live in today. We see the people that say they're Muslims, or we are Muslims, inshallah, we're the ones that park illegally. We're the ones that give all the masajid in the community. Whether you go from here all the way to Scarborough, every masjid, all the stores around us, they all don't like the Muslims. Instead of it being a place where everybody wants to be around the masjid, store owners want to stay as far away from the masjid as possible. Why? Because we park illegally. So we give the people around us, we give the people of Canada a reason to judge us. A reason to assume negatively of us. Because we put ourselves in these situations. We put ourselves in situations where it's almost impossible not to judge. And then they begin to paint all of us with one brush. They assume, oh, all Muslims park bad. All Muslims do bad business. And this isn't the etiquette of the Muslim. The etiquette of the Muslim is to have the highest standard of excellence when it comes to character, when it comes to respect, when it comes to mannerisms. Prophet ﷺ tells us in a beautiful hadith, it's a long hadith, but at the very end he says, إِنِّي زَعِيمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ فِي أَعْلَى الْجَنَّةِ he said, I am guaranteeing, guaranteeing by the Prophet وسلم, a house in the highest level of Jannah for the one that has excellence in their manners. Excellence in their manners. When we have excellent manners, there's no way they can judge us negatively. There's no way that they can look and say, oh, the Muslims are so and so. But they would be honored that they're next to a masjid. They would be honored that their neighbor is a Muslim. So that's the first thing. The second thing, we should not make assumptions of one another. We don't know where the brother or the sister was today. We don't know the difficulty of the situation. And a famous story was going on Facebook. This individual was on the train. And she sees a bunch of kids running and playing. And she's tired. She's getting more and more upset. These kids are making a lot of noise. So she goes to the father that's sitting. And she looks at him and says, Can you please tell your kids to stay quiet? And the father looks at her almost about to tear. And he says, their mother just passed away. And I don't know how to tell them. And I'm letting them play so that you know, they can be a little happy before I give them the bad news. So this individual, when she heard that, her mindset changed completely. And instead of being upset that these children were playing, she began playing with them herself and making even more noise. The purpose of this story isn't to show that this woman is great, but it's to show that when we understand what the person in front of us is going through, we begin to sympathize with them. The th actions that they do begin to make more sense to us. And one of the scholars said, look at the, per look at the way a person sees the situation. It's as if you're wearing glasses that have a pink filter. And they're wearing glasses with a green filter. You'll always see two different things. Only when
when you put their glasses on, can you see what they're going through? Can you understand their circumstances? So don't make assumptions. Don't jump to conclusions. Number three, know that where this individual is today, you might be tomorrow. Or that might have been you yesterday. This individual that isn't praying, isn't coming to the message, is drinking alcohol, doing drugs, whatever the situation may be. Don't look at them and say, oh, this person's Iman must be weak. Or this person's Islam must not be there. Or oh, look at these youth wasting time. How many times have we heard our parents tell us we are wasting time? But we as adults, for some reason, tend to forget. Tend to forget that we were them yesterday. And we're punishing them and getting angry at them for what we did yesterday. We didn't have to remember how it made us feel. And how difficult it was for us when our parents did this to us. And then we should treat them better. Make them feel more loved. The way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do it. Number four, to humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves for truly whoever humbles themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them on the day of judgment. And the last piece of homework for every one of us for this week, it's simple in words, hard in action. Treat others the way we want to be treated. So often we say it, it's like a a cliche phrase in today's day and age. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. We must hold ourselves accountable to that. Would I want people to assume badly of me? Would I want someone to look, back, look down upon me as if I am lesser than? Would I, want to insult, so I want someone to yell at me or insult me or say this to me or that to me. If the answer is no, then don't do it to anybody else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have the most excellent of character and allow us to not judge anyone. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt Allahumma hadina wa ahdi bina wa ajalna sabah ni man ihtada Allahumma hadina wa ahdi bina wa ajalna sabah ni man ihtada Ibadullah, inna Allah ya'amur bil'adli wa l'ihsani wa l'ithai l'qurba wa inna ayin fahshai wa l'munkari wa l'baghi ya'idukum na'adakum li dhakkaroon yudhkuru Allah al-azim wa yudhkurukum wa astaghfiru wa yaghfir lakum wa aqim as-salat